All right. Whoa. Nice. Pooja, what do you think about the new features? I am very excited to add them to our apps. Glad you asked, because we were actually building a project management app that helps us track our development workflow, and maybe we can improve the tool with our newly announced features. That is a great idea. I would love to see a demo. Absolutely. All right, so here's the desktop version for the project management app that we have built. As you can see, we use the draggable and drag target widgets released earlier this year to build this cool Kanban UI. But with the addition of the new action triggers, you can now do such drag interactions from scratch and customize this further. For those who are new, what are action triggers? Think of events like tapping a button, submitting a text field, toggling a switch. These are all events that you can listen to via action triggers, and we can respond to these events by adding a set of actions. If you have explored Flutterflow before, you've likely used the on-tap gesture, right? It fires when you tap a button or a container. But did you know you can actually capture all the stages of a tap gesture? For example, the on-tap down trigger is invoked when the button is pressed but not yet released, while the on-tap up happens when the button is finally released. The standard on-tap gesture that you are familiar with is actually triggered after these stages. And of course, if a tap is interrupted for any reason, the on-tap cancel gets invoked. With the new action triggers in Flutterflow, you can now attach actions to each of the stages of a tap gesture. As a quick demo, I have added a fun wiggle animation to the on tap down of a card in the Kanban UI showing that the card is being selected. Now that was the life cycle of a tap gesture. But with the new action triggers, you can also listen to events like a drag or a pinch, allowing you to create all sorts of fun UI experiences. Flutterflow also exposes useful values like the starting point or the ending point of a drag, giving you more control and flexibility. Now let's talk about the life cycle of a drag gesture. First up is the down event, which is at the first contact of the screen, which indicates that a pointer has touched the screen but not yet moved. Then comes the start event, which is when the finger has moved past a certain threshold, and this is the beginning of the drag gesture. As you continue dragging, the update event trigger is continuously triggered, giving you a lot of information about the pointer uh, position and the amount of movement since the last update. As you lift your finger from the screen or pointer leaves the screen, the end event is triggered. And of course, if a drag is interrupted, like when another gesture takes over, the cancel event is invoked. Here's a quick demo of a complete drag event. Now let's go back to the update event. This event exposes a bunch of information for you to play with, like they are available in the variable menu in the gesture detector option. First up is the global position, which allows you to get the x, y coordinates off from the left and top edge of the screen, x being the horizontal line and y being the vertical. Then comes the local position, which tells you the x, y coordinates from the left and top edge of the widget the action triggers are applied on. Then we have the delta x, y data, which tells you the delta distance from the drag start to the current drag pointer position. I guess this is working, all right. These values are extremely useful to design an intuitive user experience. For example, in our project management app, I will use the delta values to create a resizable image widget. We are saving the initial image width and height in a local state variable, and then, of course, these values will be assigned to the widget in, via the properties panel. Now let's add our first action trigger. We will add the on horizontal drag update action trigger to capture the values of a horizontal drag, allowing users to drag the image size from the right edge. The first action under this is going to be updating the component state that we created earlier. For a horizontal drag, the image width state variable would be modified, so let's choose that. 
And as you can see, the gesture detector exposes several values during a drag event. But for this example, we are mainly focused on the delta. The delta represents the delta distance from the last drag, allowing users to resize the image size as the user drags it. So now we add a quick code expression to add the current width and the delta x distance. All right, with this, our image width will be resized as the user drags it on the horizontal axis. Now we add a similar logic for on vertical drag update action trigger so we can combine the current height and the delta y distance so the users can update the image size from the vertical axis. Now here's how the final description dialog looks like. Nice. All right, so now that we are done with the content part of the description dialog, we still need some widgets to let users choose the status, the priority, assignee, et cetera. But can we build that with a single widget that makes it more reusable and save time, John? Absolutely. We can use a component and pass a widget as a parameter. Ah, tell me more. Okay. <laughs> we all know that components are reusable bits of UI. And wherever you use your component, there's always going to be something that changes. So maybe some text or some color. But up to this point, the only things that could change were widget properties, not the widgets themselves, until now. You see, now you can pass a widget, or more properly, a component, as a parameter, which means that your widget tree can be dynamic. So let me show you how this works. So we have this component right down here, and we've got these four buttons. And when you click on these, we get these custom dialogues. And these are great examples for when we can use this widget as a parameter, because we've got this stuff up here that doesn't change, and then we've got these widget trees down here that do change. So let's create this. So we're inside our base component here, and we want to define a new parameter just like we would with any other parameter. So we go in there, we add a parameter. These will be our widget contents. We select this new type, which is our widget builder down here. And just like when we're passing any other components, we'll probably have some parameters. So we're going to add one in here, which is our current selection. OK, great. So we've defined this parameter. Now we need to add it into our widget tree. That'll be the place where our component goes when we pass it in. So we're going to go in here and see we've got this new widget builder section with our widget contents parameter we just defined. Let's add it in. OK, that's great but it doesn't look so good. So let's scroll down to the bottom here, and we've got this UI properties. And inside here, you're going to see every component from your project so that you'll get a visualization of what this will look like when you pass the component. There we go. Now, this isn't actually passing it. It's just a visualization to see what it'll look like when we do pass it, which is our next step. So we're inside our component here. We're on this element, which is a custom dialog. We've selected that element. Now we need to pass our parameters. There's our widget contents. And you can see it's expecting this new type of widget builder. And underneath, we have our components down here from our project. So we can just select that. We'll do it to the rest of those here, and that's it. So there, we have refactored this UI using the Oh, I, I, so sorry. So sorry. We've refactored this UI. <laughs> OK. Pooja, you are very popular today. What is going on? I'm so sorry, but Leah has been texting me all day on Slack about this high priority task I was supposed to do today. But thanks to you, we are done with this task, so let's move this to completed. All right, so we have Leah's important task moving to completed. All right. You know what? I think I need to text her. <laughs> You know what would be great? What if we could integrate Slack so that every time the status changes to done, we get a notification? Ah, interesting, because I do have a Slack Flutterflow project that can connect to any Slack channel of your choice, and you can like send custom messages to the channel. Maybe we convert this into a library and import it into our project. Beautiful. I'd love to see it. Of course.
All right, libraries. I am most excited about this one. A basic Flutter Flow project comes with a set of dependencies. These are packages or libraries that your app depends on to function correctly. As you add new custom actions and custom widgets, they are added to this dependency list. Now, with the introduction of libraries in Flutterflow, you can turn your own projects into reusable dependencies. As in the case of our Slack Connect app, I will pu publish this project as a library so other Flutterflow projects can import it as a dependency. All right, so here's my published history for the library. Now let's go back to our demo app that will import this Slack, library, Slack project. All right, so we add, click on the add dependency, we search for the library or the project name, and now it's added to your main project. That's it. So this means you can package up an entire Flutterflow pro project having UI components like on-branded buttons, dialog boxes, APIs, custom code, app states, action blocks, and more, and share it as a library that can easily be added to other projects. This means that if you're working with teams or large enterprises managing multiple apps, libraries can streamline your development workflow and help you scale your app with a modular approach. Not only that, libraries come with versioning. So you can either choose to import an older version or whatever version of your choice in case your app depends on an older library version. Or upgrade to the latest version if you need all the latest changes. All this allows you to manage compatibility issues so without being forced to update to the latest version immediately because we know that updates can introduce breaking changes. To add the Slack Connect button from our library, we can look for the imported UI components in our widgets dialog. All right, so we add the Connect button to our settings sidebar menu. Now we are done, that's it. But here's a tip. When building libraries, it is important to provide customization options. For example, when building UI components in a library, it is it is important to ensure that you use the standard color system in, in the design system. So when the main project is importing this library, the main project's design system can take over. So our UI components can look on brand in any project that they are imported into. But if your integration or service has its own brand colors, you can add them to your library's design system as custom colors. When the main project imports these UI components using these custom colors, it will automatically follow the custom color scheme set by the library. Or you can let users customize this further. In the Slack Connect library, we have added the four brand colors into its theme, so users can select them through an enum. This ensures brand consistency, so we have added more, giving users more flexibility to choose from predefined options. Now let's talk about using the action blocks or the APIs from a library. In our demo, we will be calling the notify Slack channel action block that internally calls the webhook Slack API and pushes a snack bar on a successful API call. It also takes a string message parameter to allow the main project to customize the string message that needs to be sent to the channel. In our case, we use combined text to combine the task information in the string so we have a nice, readable, informative text sent to the channel. And that's it, let's see that in action. So we have this demo where you can quickly add the webhook ID to the app and then when you move the task to complete it, we have a notification. All right, now I can switch off my phone. <laughs> That is a great integration. And I think the best way to complete this demo would be to add some keyboard shortcuts. Oh, that's such a good productivity hack for desktop apps. Let's do it. So there are four keyboard shortcuts I wanna to add to this project. The first one is for this new issue right over here. It would be great for our users to be able to tap the C key and generate a new issue. So let's go do that. So 
We're on just a basic page here, and keyboard shortcuts are defined on the root widget right over here. So we're gonna open up our action flow editor, we're gonna add a new trigger, and you can see we've got this on shortcut press. When we press that, Flutterflow is waiting for us to tap a key which will define which key will generate this logic. So we'll press the C key, accept that, and then you've just got a normal action flow editor. So we're gonna define an action right here, an alert dialog, we're gonna add our component, and it's as simple as that. So when our users tap the C key, we get a new issue. Okay, that's keyboard shortcut number one. But what I would love is for our users to be able to complete this journey without their mouse so that they can fill out this issue and then press enter to actually create it. Okay, so let's go do that. But you might notice something different because here we are inside a component because your keyboard shortcuts can be scoped to the component. This means that your global keyboard shortcuts won't have to contain all of your sh keyboard shortcuts, and the ones that you want executed only inside a component, you can do that. But they're defined the same way, right on the root widget. So let's open that up on shortcut press and enter. We're, for this demo, we're just storing the data in an app state variable, so we'll update that, and then we'll just dismiss our dialog. Okay, so let's see it in action. Let's create a new issue, maybe record no code as trash v2, and this time be nicer. <laughs> Beautiful. So, what do we want for our last two keyboard shortcuts? Well, what if we had a navigation mode so that our users could navigate through these issues with their keyboard? And the first thing we're gonna need for that is a navigation mode. So let's add a variable for that we'll add a navigation mode Boolean. Okay, so we can add our keyboard shortcut. We're gonna use control or command enter, and yes, you can use combination shortcuts, and they're defined in the same way. Then we're simply going to toggle that value. Okay, great, so we've updated, we're in navigation mode, but we haven't indicated this to the user in any way, right? So what I wanna do is add a nice purple border around the issue that is selected. And to do that, we're gonna to need to know which item is selected. So we're gonna to have to add another variable. Here is our selected item variable, and we're just gonna need some custom code to grab the first one. Then finally, we're gonna come over to our border color right here. We're gonna check if we are in navigation mode and if the item right here that's selected is the one that's returned from that function, then we'll give it a nice, pretty purple border. Okay, then we just update that logic and there it is. We can do Control Command Enter and enter into and out of navigation mode. Well, of course, no navigation mode would be complete if we couldn't arrow around here, so let's add that logic. So first we're gonna need four functions to handle each one of that, those logics, so we select the next item below or left or right. Then we're gonna bind those to each of our arrow keys, and arrows are just keys, so they work in the same way. And we'll update each one of our selected item variables with those functions. And there we have it. Control or Command Enter and arrow through all of those. But you know what? I just thought of another keyboard shortcut that would be great. What if we had a Control Alt Delete? John, 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 John. <laughs> I think we've had enough shortcuts. But those are such cool features. They are available next week. Who's excited to try them out? <laughs> And wouldn't it be great if we had an action triggers competition with prizes? Absolutely. And we are so excited to see how you experiment with these 